coming to you straight from the Rio Grande and beyond and beyond broadcasting to the four corners of the globe so grab your seat your coffee or your sundowner okay everybody here we go on point as always this is gloves off gloves off Back at you and gloves off. I'm Paul Buitron and I'm here with Lulu and we're going to touch base on a subject matter that touches the hearts, touches so many, especially here in Texas and across the United States and the globe, is parent, parental alienation. A lot of people do not understand that parental alienation exists. A lot of, uh, many, many folks are now understanding the terminology. Um, but we're, we'll touch base with a young lady that went through parent alienation, realized, and is helping many. How are we doing today, Lulu? You're doing good? I'm doing good. You know, um, let's, let's touch base on a little bit on your, on your story. Tell us what parent, parental alienation is in your, in your view. In my view, parental alienation, well, first of all, the term parental alienation is, is strange to me um, because, yes, a parent is being alienated from the child, and yes, the parent that is being alienated understands the, um, the restriction of that bond or whatever activities um, their parental guidance allows them to give a child their child. Um, but in my mind, it's, it's child-focused. Um, because of what I went through, I, I was a victim, essentially, it's, it's child abuse. Um, so in other forms of child abuse, we don't call it, um, you know, we call it child abuse. We call it, um, it's titled with child. Um, so I'm not trying to exclude the parent as a victim either, because yes, of course, the parent is the victim. And a lot of awareness is put on the parent that is being alienated. Um, but a lot more focus needs to be inclusive of the child itself, rather than just the, the phrase, um, the child's best interest. So uh, in a defined role, it's, uh, it's really about the child. Um, I think that needs to be more inclusive in the narrative when people talk about it with the parent that is being affected. Absolutely. And I, I couldn't agree with you more. And um, I've seen, before I learned the term parental alienation, okay, I knew something was wrong because you, you see it with friends, with family, as you're growing up, you see things happening but you quite don't understand what's going on, okay? You see it happening to others, and you're kind of like, you know, why so harsh? I do not know if it's, if it's parental alienation or the parent that is committing the alienation of the other parent, okay, towards a child. I don't know if they're doing it on purpose. I don't know if it's something that becomes habit or is it some, or many of them don't know that they're doing it. Okay. Those are the three questions that I have that I've always, and nobody can answer them to me because to me, I think that they've been inside a divorce battle that there's so much grudge that it becomes something that it's, a, I'm protecting you from that person that they removed you from. And I, I think it becomes a habit then it becomes an extreme. Understand? Then later on, they kind of realize what it is. How do you feel about that? Um, well, I definitely understand the different frames of mind that you kind of ask questions on. Um, to me, I kind of view it as a mental illness um, in the sense that the alienator may not understand what they're doing. Um, and if they are called out on it or they do have some sort of recognition of self-awareness, um, 
those people are still not willing to change their behaviors and their actions. Therefore, at that point, it becomes intentional. Um, so there's, there's a lot of variables that go into, um, does the person know they're doing it? If, if they did know, would they be willing to change it? Um, and I agree with you on all of those points. They're definitely important questions that everybody needs to be asking. Absolutely. Um, you know, I don't, I know it's severe in whichever, whichever level, but there's some levels that it start off, it starts off with, you can't talk to your child today. He's doing his homework. The next day you call, you can't talk to him now. He's doing homework and it continues. Okay. Then, then it really becomes bad. And I think it becomes more intentional when they stop depriving you of visitation rights. Okay. How do you feel about that? It absolutely starts with the most minuscule transfer of power in, in a dynamic. Um, it's like a, a child testing the, the rules and the boundaries of their, their household when they're growing up, whether they're sure. being raised by parent, guardian, whatsoever. The child is always going to test the waters sure. and therefore... Um, uh, a broken person from a broken relationship is going to do exactly the same thing. No, you're, you're correct. And, um, and it really, uh, this is my opinion. This is my view towards the start and the fueling of it. I think the starting of parental alienation starts with those wearing the black robes and the sound of the gavel. As soon as the decree is finalized, the divorce is finalized, the decree is signed, that right there starts parental alienation. I don't know if, if we can send the, and it's usually the custodial parent that does it, the one that has the child, they're the ones that have them. It's not the other way around. So, and it continues, and it continues into the interference of child cust, uh, visitation rights, okay? And that's where the, in Texas, you have the penal code 2503. And, and you hear this throughout with parents throughout uh, Texas. You know, I went to go pick up my child that wasn't ready. The police come over, it's a civil matter, even though it's a felony. That is fueling the alienation, the alienation. That's giving it more power. Understand what I'm saying? And uh, I don't know how we can teach the police i think there's an excellent advocate group that's that's teaching the police that but i think that's where it comes from one starts it the judge starts it and the police fuel it and if you have that narcissist individual in there that does the alienation well of course she's going to do whatever to be more empowered how do you feel about that um i i think you're right on several of those points um People separate uh, whether they were married or they just need a child custody order. They're still going to the courts. They're going to someone in a black robe saying, hey, you know, we can't do this in a civil manner. We do not have a copacetic parenting relationship. We need a piece of paper that decrees what our duties and responsibilities are. Um, most of the time it starts out with a temporary order that just something real basic, um, especially here in the state of Texas, you get um, a piece of paper that says you shall not disrupt the child's environment, you shall not um, remove them from the parent, you shall not, you, so many of these activities are restricted to keep um, a standard of living for the child or the children. Um, and it starts with that very basic piece of paper because you're assigning rights and duties. And so one parent may look at that and be like, oh, well, um, they, they have this after, you know, the child has this after school activity. This says that the child's environment cannot be disrupted. So that means that I don't have to inform the other parent that they have an after school activity that, inter that interferes with the parenting time schedule when that parent thinks that, oh, well, the child's going to get off the bus and go to the other parent at the end of the day. Well, this parent was never notified about the after school activity. I mean, sure. there's a lot of interpretation that parents use um, to 
instigate that mentality of alienation. Um, and so judges are not most of the time, they don't have a lot of background in child upbringing, um, like a psychological background or um, something that is based in children and their needs being met. A lot of their background is in law degree. So, I mean, what part of a law degree is going to establish someone um, having the appropriate background to establish those rights and duties? That has nothing to do with children. That has nothing to do with yeah. their standard of life. Um, and then when it comes to the police, yeah, um, we have this law that says any person, any person, it doesn't say parent, doesn't say grandparent, doesn't say neighbor or friend, it says any person person that retains a child subject to a custody order you're subject to a felony charge so i mean police feel that they either aren't allowed to do anything about it or they're being told don't do anything about it because it's a civil matter well if it was a civil matter then it would be in the civil co codes and believe it or not um 2503 does have its own civil version in the codes. So that specifies that, yeah, there, there are civil remedies. They're not wrong in stating that it is a civil issue, but parents are being denied criminal justice remedies. That's the bigger issue there. No, you're, you're correct. And, and I do not want to throw any parent in jail. I don't want to see anybody hurt. But what I'm saying is if they would enforce it, you'll see parental alienation decrease. Absolutely. There has okay. to be some accountability. To see, you will see it doing it. And to me, um, you know, the bickering between the police officers and the DAs here in, in, in Texas has to stop. They have to start doing their job. And because it's for the benefit of the child. And they're, like you said, it's child. It's a form of child abuse. I had never seen it that way, but it, it makes sense. It is a form of child, abuse. and they should take care of it. Now, let's touch on your story. When did you first notice that you were being alienated, or it had, you, you were a victim? How did it happen? Um. So I was a military brat. Uh, we lived in Alaska, so there was a a huge shift in my family's dynamic. Not only were we moving to the lower 48 into an environment um, that we weren't familiar with, um, we were also told that our parents were no longer going to be married. Um, that was a shaky experience in itself. Um, so I think there for a long time, I didn't notice a whole lot other than one of my parents just wasn't there anymore. Um, and because of society standards, I think I accepted that as a norm. You know, um, other friends had parents that got divorced, they would live with their mom, or their dad wasn't involved. Those were the, the standard um, expectations that I had in my reality. Um, as far as actually observing alienation for what it was and starting to pick up on those, those hues, um, it didn't necessarily detect in the relationship between my father and I, because between my father and I, um, alienation tactics were very strong. Um, I didn't see him a whole lot in person. Um, and so a lot of it was electronical communication between him and I that was intercepted by my mother. Um, so after she has succeeded in the alienation of that relationship, she focused on my friendships. And later when I became a uh, young adult dating, she would focus on my romantic relationships. So that's really where I started to notice alienation was in my personal life with friends and relationships. And as my life naturally progressed, I applied that to the relationship between my father and I. Um, so you're, you're talking about a period that started around six years old, and I didn't have any actual independent recognition of alienation until I was about 22 years old. 
that's a huge gap. And, and that happens many times with a lot of kids that were alienated from one parent. They'll grow up in the mid, usually in the mid twenties, they realize it and, and everything just shifts, you know? And uh, did that shift occur with you? In other words, you went with your father and started seeing less of your mother? Um, so actually it was very drastic. Um, I, I met a wonderful person. I was still living with my mother, um, had children, had been married previously. Um, so I had entered this new relationship and he built me up into a stronger woman. Um, I became very defensive against my mother's tactics. Um, and, and so one at one point, I just decided that's it. That's enough. My, my children are not going to live like this. And so there was a point in time where all communication with my mother and my grandmother completely ceased to exist. I cannot tell you the weight that was lifted from me. I had no idea the weight that I was carrying on my shoulders. Um, and it took about two years after that momentum for me to reach out to my father. Um, and my father and I were still building a relationship. It's very slow. It's very shaky. Um, I honestly have a lot of guilt for that relationship not existing throughout the years. I know as a child, that's not really my fault, but I still, um, I still hold a lot of guilt for that because I accepted my mother's narrative and I used it against him over the years. Um, but yeah, it was a very dramatic ending with my mother. And I'm sure when I opened up to my father and reached out to him, I'm sure it was very surprising. Um, but I can tell you, it was very heartwarming and he was very welcome, you know, arms open. You could tell that he had just been waiting for the moment. He was. Sure. And in those moments, you, you know, um, that, and, and, in, and in, his, in his view, he also all the time that he lost from being with his daughter. You know, everything comes, everything just kind of gets squashed together. So, you know, and uh, I'm sorry it happened to you. I'm sorry that it's going through with many, many kids. And uh, it's how, let me put it to you this way. Here's a question. How can you get somebody to realize the little forks or little things that are that are interference with childhood. Understand what, what I'm trying to say? How can you recognize it at a the beginning stages? What yes. are some of the points? Um, I think it's important for uh, to start with. If you know somebody in your family that is getting divorced, whether it is your child that's going through a divorce or your sister or your cousin, I think it's important for family and friends close to those folks that are getting divorced to pay attention. All right. A lot of people, they look at it like it's not my relationship. It's not my business. I don't want to get involved with it. But you know what? You supported that couple through um, their happy moments. You supported that couple, you know, maybe at their wedding, during their anniversaries, on their birthdays together. You supported that couple at some point. And Absolutely. from that, there, there came a child or children. All right. It's not that their relationship is your business, but the welfare and the safety of any child should be anybody's business. If you see, uh, you see it on the news all the time. If you see a child locked in a car, you call 911, right? Why are we not on a high alert for children that are in an alienated situation? You know, you, you saw this couple together. They were involved parents. They were loving parents, cared about this child. All of a sudden, he's a deadbeat dad. Where did that narrative come from? All of a sudden, he's an absent father. Where is that coming from? He sure. was there the whole time they were in a relationship together. So those are things to look out for. Drastic narrative changes in the relationship between the child and a parent. Everybody should question that. 
everybody should question the power exchange because when you're together, there are certain rights and duties that you don't have a piece of paper telling you that it's your job to be a parent. But you have certain roles that you fill in the relationship and in your parenting. Absolutely. Some of that, some of that will change to the degree that you're going to have to balance more or less what was there in the relationship when you had shared responsibilities, but now you're not sharing it with that person as much. So you have to be on high alert when you see those situations and you have to say something. You have to say, hey, I don't think it's right for you to talk about his dad that way. Or I don't think it's right for you to talk about her mom in front of her like that. That's not right. I don't think it's right for you to withhold, um, you know, your, your new boyfriend doesn't need to go to the daddy daughter dance with her. That's not right. You know, um, people need to speak up. People need to call out their friends and family. It's okay to do that because you're protecting a child. You need to stop worrying about the, the adults. You need to stop worrying about um, what they think about the other parent. You need to worry about what the child thinks, what they're feeling. Are they getting enough love from both parents? That's what people need to worry about. Absolutely. You know, you're, you're on point. You're on point with that. Um, I see it changes because I'm going to, from my experience, okay, from my point. Uh, when I got divorced, kind of a little bit right after that, my sister got divorced from her husband. It was a, it was a Father's Day. I was supposed to be seeing my, my kids. On Friday, all of a sudden, they show up and she shows up and she says, well, guess what? They're going to summer camp. And it starts this this weekend, so I go, yeah, but we had fa it's Father's Day. How come we didn't how come we didn't sign them up some Mother's Day? You know, I told I told her that. And she goes, well, you you know, and the first thing that was told in front of the kids was, you don't love them. You're not going to send them off to. And my kids started crying, so I said, you know, you all go. I get, get uh, I kissed them and they left. And I was sitting down at uh, in my house during well, my parents' house, you know, I went to go visit my father for Father's Day and my mom was there and they were flipping out. And my sister was there with her. And I said, how come he's not with his father? He had just gotten divorced. And right away, my mom and my aunt said, no, she ne they need to stay with their mom. And how come your kids aren't here? It's Father's Day, how come they're not with you? And I basically stood up and I said, the same rights that I have, to see my kids on Father's Day and plans were changed is the same rights his father has to see him on Father's Day. And you all are removing his father's rights to see him. I, I go, and I realized then that there was some subcultural reason to kind of remove the kid from the father subculturally that exists here in the United States. Understand what I'm saying? That people are not aware of, but they do it. And I think that it has to be re-educated. I think, I don't know how we can come up with some kind of class that it's mandatory. So when people do get divorced or they go into a, a custody visitation rights, they see a film of what parental alienation is, that you have to see it by the courts, whether you see it, you take a test at the end and you send it in before you can get a divorce, before your degree is signed. You know what I mean? So with that, you would eliminate a lot of things. I don't know if that could be something that we can push for. Well, unfortunately, their solution for that right now is, is requiring parents to take a parenting class before they get a divorce. And they'll they'll say that, you know, it's included in the course, you know, that we ex only accept certain classes and it's covered in the classes that we accept. Unfortunately, there's a narrative that there's already a solution in place. So there has to be something stronger. There has to be something more. There definitely has to be more awareness. I mean, it's some, an interesting point. I was just watching the inauguration and there was this wonderful lady, uh, Amanda Gorman, she did a, an inauguration poem and she cited in her poem 
something to overcome and adapt was being raised in a single mother household. I mean, that's how commonplace the narrative is that Americans, that kids are raised in a single parent household, specifically single mother household. I mean, we need to look at the flip side of, of that narrative. It needs mm -hmm. to be commonplace. Absolutely. Absolutely. You're correct. Anything else you'd like to bring to the forefront on this subject? Um, I mean, I just want to see more people get involved. Um, not, not just parents, um, not just family and friends and parents, but I want to see more people in power get involved. I know there are so many other issues out there, but this is one that really needs to stop being put on a back burner. Um, this is something that you're right. It needs re-education all the way around. Um, we need to classify this as child abuse. Honestly, people should be able to call a phone number and report what they're seeing and it be investigated. It has to be, or else we are going to start seeing this. Um, we're going to start seeing any momentum that we have right now. We're going to start seeing that decline. And then this is not going to change. The, this this moment, these years now where people are coming up and speaking up about it, this is the moment that we have to change it and we need to take advantage of it. No, you're correct. You're correct. And um, well, we'll get together. We'll have some more pondering to do with people out there, but I think the education of, of what parental alienation is. And there's other... There's, some countries that have specific, you get your divorce is finalized and there's laws that you, if you do not allow your child or you alienate them from another parent, there's, uh, uh, there's penalties that you can pay. I know Brazil has that. I know it has. So it's, uh, we just have to not only, there's a lot of people need to be educated, attorneys, judges, police, the whole community, schools, everybody, everybody, because schools also do the same thing. They aid on that. You know, one thing that I was, uh, as going through the divorce, one thing that I noticed was that all the tests that were held on Saturdays, all the tests, all the competitions, all the inner mural competitions they were all held on on saturdays but well, which saturdays first third and fifth they were not held on the second and fourth they were all held on the first third and fifth you understand what i'm saying and when you start okay it falls the same you see that pattern and i called it out to one of the school school, school uh, districts here and they said, oh, it's, that's because our teachers, some of them are, are single moms, and that's when their son goes out to visit the father. Yeah, and I go, but a lot of these kids go visit their father as well. So you're, you're removing the time with their father because of this. And, and, one, and the, the local parochial schools here started changing it. They started bouncing it around, which, which was good. So like I said, I think the education has to be out there. But I want to thank you, Lulu, for standing up, telling everybody your experience, telling everybody the problem, and please continue doing with what you're doing because you're a beacon. And you're a light that's, that's out there and you're guiding a lot of people, even if they hear you once, they understand you already planted that seed in, in their head. It'll make them realize later on. I want to thank you. You're welcome. And uh, today. folks, I hope you learned something today. It's a, this is a problem that is that goes on not only in Texas, throughout the world. And um, parental alienation, if you recognize it, stop, put a stop to it. If uh, you need some counseling, give us a call. We can, we can get some, somebody to counsel you if you're going through, through the problem here. Uh, you can reach me at uh, wethronacademy2012 at gmail.com. That's my email. You can drop a comment here at the bottom. If you like the shows and continue moving forward, subscribe, you know, because we got, uh, we're touching a lot of 
community issues that exist that people might not have foreseen it yet. Okay. Lulu, thank you. You're welcome. Folks, peace. Today, in America, more than 5.5 million men, women, and children train in a martial art regularly. Bui Tarun Academy has been serving Laredo for over 30 years now. Our adult classes are geared for producing the best in you, teaching you street-ready techniques. With the arts of Savat and Kinpo, you'll learn the traditions of these sciences of combat as passed down professor to student. Hello, everybody. My name is Senior Grandmaster of Fede Bandalan, owner of BDP, Bandalan the Sweet Parties. I'd like to say a few words on Grandmaster Paul Bitron. He's a man of great integrity, a man of great knowledge of martial art. He's a master of Sabbat and master of Iskrima. He's a man that can help you to become what you want to be. He's a man that teaches people how to be somebody in life, how to be, how to work the world how to be happy in this world. He's a man that I can say hold many, many integrity as well as in martial art. But I'd like to say this man has a radio station that's hunting all over the world. And he works with all kind of people, all walks of life. All I, all I want to say that Paul Bitron is a man that can help people to be somebody in life. I'd like to say aloha. Thank you. I am Grandmaster Michael Duran of Original Huron Criminal Federation here in Vallejo, California. Professor Paul Bitron is an accomplished martial artist who has developed an understanding that as a caretaker, in our martial arts, it is a responsibility to keep the art alive and in depth. He acknowledged that it is the students that give the art life. I hold his friendship and his continuing accomplishments in the art in the most highest regard. Thank you. Come train at the best kept secret of Laredo. Give us a call for your free evaluation at 956 401 4868 or check out our website at savat.biz. Follow us on YouTube and Facebook.